be here this morning to worship God with all of you, and what an incredible service we've had thus far, guys. I mean, what a rousing welcome right there with the Costa and Kira Collymore. I mean, guys, they, they look good. They sound good. I feel super welcome to be here this morning. And then a powerful prayer by Brandon Paris, uh, looking good over there as well. You know, you got to pray for the Wi-Fi not to cut out every time we have a virtual service. So, bro, we'll, we'll see how righteous you are this morning. Lord, when we have a smooth, a smooth service, amen. Uh, but that was awesome. And then really, Kat, with an amazing, amazing communion. Kat, thank you so much, sis. So grateful for you leading us to the foot of the cross, your vulnerability, your sharing, and just letting us know what you've been through, letting us know your life, what has happened, and uh, your gratitude for the kingdom, your gratitude for the cross, is a, is a higher calling for all of us. So thank you so much. And then, man, I, I didn't know we had a had a preacher in the house. I didn't know we had Solomon, the preacher Hardy, leading us in contribution right there. I mean, that's right. Dropping one liners galore, guys. I mean, one liners here, one liners there. Now you know. He said, uh, "We we don't just take from God; we give to God." And then if we grow weary, giving becomes more about us and less about God. And that there were just there were so many flying all over the place, knives and daggers going out everywhere. And so I feel convicted. I'm excited to give. And, uh, bro, I'm sure you're going to be giving uh, a deep and a, a big amount your whole lifetime as you give to God and die a faithful disciple in the Lord. So, man, we got to have Solo doing contribution more often, guys. You're going to see a spike in the contra right here. Amen. But, uh, guys, it's awesome to be here. And uh, incredible, incredible to be at service this morning with all of you. And I do want to congratulate the church and lift everybody up. Last week, we had our Bring Your Neighbor Day. And I don't think I got to announce it uh, at service or in the group chat or anything like that. I announced it at leaders meeting. But the highest attendance that we had ever had previously in the South region, and you guys, <laughs> this is totally God, was 166. And literally last Sunday, we had 100. And 67 in attendance, literally one more than we had ever had. That's totally God. I was praying like, God, please, at least 167. And I'm glad he gave me at least what I was praying for right there. Amen. And so it's awesome. Give yourself a round of applause right there. Incredible bringer in every day. And uh, we finished up the book of Mark. And so now today we're going to start the book of Acts. And so we're going to go through a four-part Acts series in the church and uh, to figure out, hey, what was the first century church doing? All of us, we know Acts 1 and 2 very well, right? Jesus comes and preaches the kingdom. He ascends into heaven. The day of Pentecost, the kingdom comes. Repent and get baptized. 3,000 were baptized. And then they had a great fellowship, devoted themselves to these four things. All of us know that super well. But what did they do afterwards? What was the next step for the church? How did they build? What, what did that look like? And so the title for the, for the lesson this morning is Building a Great Church. Building a Great Church. And we're going to be in chapters 4 through 8 this morning and figure out how did the apostles and the, the disciples build a great church in the first century, a church that we are wanting to imitate today. Go to Acts chapter 4, and we'll start here. Acts chapter 4. And if at any point you get fired up this morning, feel free to unmute yourself. You know, let us hear it. <laughs> it's still. Oh, come on. Come on, come on, Joe. Come on. No, Sam, let's get it. You know, the computer screen is so unforgiving. You know what I mean? It's like you're preaching and it's quiet. I just get to see some of your guys' faces. So if I'm at the right, you know, little, little link right here in the top, I'll get to see Brandon fired up or the brothers fired up. And that kind of helps me out a little bit. But, uh, you know, can't wait to be back in person. Okay, Acts chapter 4, and we'll be in verse 8 now. I got a little fellowship break right there, man. Acts 4, verse 8, and we're just going to restart. So Peter <laughs> is there, and he's, he's letting the Pharisees, the Sadducees, know what had happened. He's giving his account. Then Peter, repeat right here, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, 
which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Amen. And this is awesome. Peter and John, they're there. They say, hey, you want to know how we did this? We're going to tell you. It's by the name of Jesus that, oh, yeah, you crucified that we just did this. There's no other name under heaven by which you can be saved. He's preaching the word to them, and that should fire us on up as disciples. They preach. The Pharisees and the Sanhedrin right here, all these religious guys, they're so blown away because these unschooled ordinary men, they're like, wait a second. Aren't these the fishermen? Aren't these the illiterate guys, the fishermen? Unschooled ordinary, and ordinary in the Greek is the word idiote. And so they were saying, these are the unschooled idiots. And yet they noticed that they had spent time with Jesus. You know, isn't it awesome that Jesus transform, transforms us like this? That when we spend time with Jesus, we become more bold, more confident, more evangelistic. That's right, bro. Come on. So that we are totally changed. That people look at us and say, man, Joey, what happened to that redneck from Alabama? Come on. Are you kidding me? He's like, he's preaching now on Sundays. What happened? I've been with Jesus. Look at Gavin, man. He used to have a mullet. Oh my gosh. What happened to him? He's been spending time with Jesus. The Collymores, Tiffany, Angel, everybody here has been transformed by spending time with Jesus. Amen. So they say this. Well, how does this play out? What happens? Let's go to verse 17. Now the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they take a, they convene a little bit. They're like, okay, how are we going to get them to stop this? How do we stop this thing from, from spreading right here? Verse 17 it says, but to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him, you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. So the Pharisees, Sadducees, they come back. They're like, oh my gosh, okay. The only way that we can stop this thing from spreading is if we get them to stop talking about it we don't have to change what they believe we don't have to change their fellowship we don't have to change their unity the only way and what we need to do is to get them to stop talking about it and yet what does peter and john say they say hey we're not going to listen to you we're going to listen to god and we're going to preach the word you know guys it's the same for us it's the same for us all all persecution is from satan and so what is satan's plan if he can get us to stop opening up our mouths about Jesus, he can stop the gospel from spreading. Wow. He doesn't have to affect our unity. He doesn't even have to change our belief. His sole purpose is to get us to stop talking about Jesus, to get us to stop sharing our faith, to get us to stop evangelizing. And hey, with that, he will stop the advancement in the kingdom. But in the same way, we got to say, we're going to listen to God, not to you, not to any man, not even to ourselves, and continue to preach the word. Amen. They get threatened and persecuted. How do they how do they remain confident? What do they do to persevere right here? Verse 23 says, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and your will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke 
the word of God boldly. So they get persecuted and then they get threatened. They're like, hey, don't speak in this name anymore. And this was a very viable threat because they had just seen Jesus crucified on the cross. So this wasn't like, yeah, these guys are just bluffing right here. It's like, no, they just hung Jesus on the cross and killed him. And this could happen to us as well. And yet they go, they're like, man, this is what's happening, guys. We're getting threat threats and we're getting persecuted. What do we got to do? And they immediately go to prayer. They immediately, immediately go pray together. And it's awesome because where they were was shaken. God allowed an earthquake to happen and they preach more boldly. But consider their prayer. They didn't pray for the situation to change. They didn't pray for the Pharisees to get taken out. They didn't pray for the obstacles to be moved. They prayed for boldness and to be enabled to do the work of the Lord. They were perseverant and prayerful. If we want to build a great church, guys, if we want to imitate the first century church, we've got to be perseverant and prayerful. And that's our first point this morning. Perseverant Uh-oh. and prayerful. You know, guys, being a disciple is challenging. Being a disciple is tough, man. We go through hard weeks. We go through hard days. We go through hard hours. I mean, it's challenging at times, even here in Cats communion and fighting for faith. You know, all of us fight for faith on a daily basis. It's a tough life. There's challenges. We're not Buddhists. We don't try to eliminate suffering. Our Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ, who died on a cross and said, hey, if you want to be my disciple, you actually have to follow me and carry your cross daily. You gotta. You think it was just me that was going to carry this thing? You got to pick it up and carry it as well. That's right. Come on, it's Joey. It's challenging. It's tough to be a disciple. We go through many hardships. And then I just consider these scriptures. Hebrews 12. Hardship is discipline from God. Mm, it's training right there. Romans 5. Suffering produces perseverance and character. 1 Thessalonians 3 says that as disciples suffering is our destiny, that we are destined to suffer. And James 1 says, consider it pure joy when you go through trials of many kinds. That's convicting right there. And yet one of my favorite ones is Romans 8, verse 28. Romans 8, verse 28. And it says in verse 20, it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Isn't that awesome? And for me, I used to always just read this scripture. And whenever something bad would happen, I'd say Romans 8, 28. <laughs> Babe, Romans 8, 28 right there. But I would think, I would read this scripture and say, man, God works all things for my good. What is, what is for my good? You know, having a ribeye steak tonight is for my good. God, you work all things for my good. You know, getting, getting a promotion or, you know, getting a new car or something, that's for my good, you know. God, you're good, you know. Uh, uh, whatever it may be, rest and relaxation, that is for my good. I want it good, guys. I want God's goodness in my life. But then you've got to read verse 29 as well. It says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, so what does this mean? God works all things for our good to be more like Christ right? So, so what the things that he's working out for us is to make us more like Christ. Well, what does that entail? A lot of sufferings. So it's not that, that, uh, you know, these ribeyes and stuff, they're not good, but what's the best thing for us? It's to suffer, to be more like Christ. Oh my gosh. And even, you know, that, that's, that sounds crazy. And even when we're going through hardship, you'd be like, man, God, please take this suffering away. Take this hardship away. Take these challenges away. This isn't good. And yet God is saying, no, this is good. I want you to be more like my son. I want you to be more like Christ. He doesn't want to take the sufferings out of our life. He wants us to walk with him as we go through the sufferings and the challenges and the trials and to persevere. We got to persevere and pray. You know, in World War II, there was a French officer by the name of Andre Zernheld, and he was killed in World War II, and he was a, a paratrooper. And as he was killed, they, they went and searched his body, and they found a notebook with a prayer in it. And it was so impactful that now to this day, this is the official prayer 
of the French, Portuguese, and Brazilian Airborne Forces. Isn't that pretty amazing? That this is their official prayer. And what is the prayer? Well, here it is. This is what this guy wrote. This was his prayer to God. And it says, I'm asking you, God, to give me what you have left. Give me those things which others never ask of you. I don't ask you for rest or tranquility, not that of the spirit, the body, or the mind. I don't ask you for wealth or success or even health. All those things are asked of you so much, Lord, that you can't have any left to give. Give me instead, Lord, what you have left. Give me what others don't want. I want uncertainty and doubt. I want torment and battle. And I ask that you give them to me now and forever, Lord, so I can be sure to always have them because I won't always have the strength to ask again. But give me also the courage, the energy, and the spirit to face them. I ask you these things, Lord, because I can't ask them of myself. What a powerful prayer right there. And right here, this is so incredible because this guy understood the power of hardship. That as we fight for our faith on a daily basis, as we go through hardship, as we go through suffering, these things train us and mold us to become more like Christ if we let them. We don't need to pray for the situation to change. We don't need to pray for it to be easier, although that is the temptation. What God wants us to do and what we need to pray for is to pray for strength to overcome. Pray for the strength to walk with God through the challenges, through the hardships, and to overcome so we can be more like Christ and get stronger spiritually. I want to challenge us. Change your perspective on hardship. Hardship is training from God. It doesn't feel good in the moment, but it will when you get through it. Persevere by relying on God in prayer. And don't pray for God to take away the situation or the circumstances or the, or the, the obstacles. Pray for strength to face them. Come on, if bro. we want to build a great church, we've got to be perseverant and prayerful. Moving on to our second point, back in Acts chapter 4, we see that they were persevering and prayerful, but what else did they do? Acts 4 verse 32. Acts 4 verse 32. Come on, Joey. And it says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So we see these guys are united family. And now the church was probably a little more than 10,000. And you got to think what this is saying. No needy person among them. That's impressive for 10,000 people in the first century right there. And how is there no needy person? Well, it says God's grace was working amongst them by what? People selling things and giving to the needy. Not just anything, but selling their houses, selling fields, selling lands to give to the needy disciples and their hearts, they were generous givers. And the second point this morning is generous givers. If we want to build a great church, we have got to have hearts to give to God, to give to his people. We've got to be generous givers. And it even talks about Barnabas. This is the first time that he's mentioned. And what is he doing? He's selling his land and giving it to the disciples. We see the generous givers right here, but what is the opposite of this? What's the opposite of a generous giver? Go to chapter five, one chapter over right there in verse one. Come on, bro. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to just human beings, but to God. 
When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Oh my goodness. So we've got Ananias and Sapphira, and they sell some land, but then willingly and knowingly hold back some of the money and then bring the rest of the apostles. And Peter's like, hey, how could you lie to the Holy Spirit, not by not bringing all the amount, but by lying about it? That was the issue. And he strikes it. Uh, he, he, he dies right there, gets struck by, by God. Then Sapphira comes three hours later, and Peter's feeling gracious. He's like, okay is this the amount that you guys sold it for? And she's like, yeah, it is. You know, yeah, that is. She gets struck down dead as well. And both of them die right here. Guys, this is the New Testament, right? This isn't any Old Testament stuff. This is some New Testament stuff. What's the point? God takes giving seriously. God takes giving seriously. It's not that they didn't bring all of the money, but it's that they lied about it because of their greed. They lied about it because of their greed. You know, money is the most spoken about topic in the Bible. You guys know that? Money is the most spoken about topic in the scriptures. It's mentioned more than 800 times in the Bible. Some of my favorites, Deuteronomy 16 says, don't come to God empty handed. Malachi 3 says that we can rob God with our lack of giving. And then Matthew 6, 21, it says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. You know, our giving shows what we're invested in. What do you give a lot to? What do you spend your money on? That will show you what you're invested in. That will show you well, where your heart is. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So guess what? As disciples, as a disciple, if I'm smart, where do I want my heart to be? In the kingdom, with God. So therefore, what am I going to give most to? The kingdom. And yet, if I'm not invested in the kingdom, then I'm going to be giving begrudgingly. I'm, not, I'm just going to give my leftovers, and I'm going to be giving my, my finances, my money somewhere else and hold back a lot and just give a little bit, just like Ananias and Sapphira. And this is so bad. Ananias and Sapphira, they got killed for this. They got taken out. But we can die spiritually as well if we don't have the conviction to be generous in our giving towards God in his church. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it says, God loves a cheerful giver. So God loves people who cheerfully give to him, and he's able to give back because in verse 6, it says, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will reap generously. God knows how to bless you, man. Let me tell you, you think I'm, I'm married right now with a kid on the way because, you know, I'm just a lucky dude? No, it's because I invested so much to God. I've given my life to God. And guess what? He's like, this guy, he's invested. I'm going to give back to him. You think Gavin's dating on accident right now? No, it's because he's faithful in his giving. Amen. Come on, Joey. So incredible examples. The Bradleys, the, the Collymore, so many of us. But we've got to have a conviction. And I think as Americans, this could be so challenging for us. Because we live in the most prosperous country in the world, and yet per perhaps the most greedy country in the world. We are taught at a young age to worship money. We're taught at a young age to worship success. And yet we cannot worship money. We cannot worship success. And greed, in fact, in Colossians 3, 5, it is idolatry of wealth. We cannot worship these things. Instead, as God's people, as his church, we've got to put God in the right place and worship him. And how can you tell if you're doing this? You're faithful and you're giving to God. You're faithful and you're giving to God. Are you faithful in your contribution? You might be like, man, well, he's just talking about money, the church money, this and that. No, money has nothing, almost nothing to do with the church and everything to do with your relationship with God. 
It is in every way a hard issue. And I want to help you guys out. I want to help us out because I know the people who God bless are those that give to him. You know, finances as well. This is the only time in the Bible that, that God says to test me in this in Malachi 3. He says, test me in this and see if I won't bless you abundantly that you won't even have enough room to store everything I give you. That's right. Come on, Joey. And I want us, we, we have to be a church that has a conviction that we give generously to God. God doesn't need our five bucks, man. God doesn't need our, our hundred bucks. God doesn't need our money. Our hearts need to give to worship God, to be invested in his kingdom, to have our hearts soft in this way. And we've got to be generous givers to God. And I love the contrast right here because it talks about Ananias and Sapphira. They get taken out, done. And yet before that, it talks about Barnabas. He sold the field, gave his money. And then what kind of life did Barnabas have? An amazing life. Went on missionary journeys with Paul, preached the word, did all kinds of incredible things. And God was able to use him because of his heart to worship God and not to get tied up in the finances, the money, all of that. You know, when I think of generous givers and I think of some people who've had awesome lives for God, I think of Lance and Connie Underhill. I just think of the Underhills have given up so much, have sacrificed so much, have sold so many things, literally houses and boats and all these different things to move to Portland, to join the new movement, to come down here to LA. And they sacrifice again and again and again. And look at how God has blessed them. Look at how God has blessed their life. They've got a son and daughter in the ministry, evangelist and women's ministry leader, leading Minneapolis, Minnesota. They've got another son and daughter, Joseph and Magnolia, here with us in the South region, missionaries all over the world. They're in the Crown of Thorns Council. They, they've traveled the world. They, they've, they're shepherds in the region. They've done so many incredible things. Why? Because of their hearts to give to God. We will never be able to outgive God. God will always be able to give us more if we'll just give to him first. God being able to use us starts with our heart. And I want to challenge all of us. Let's be generous givers. Let's be generous givers. Be faithful in your contribution and be faithful in your missions. Amen. Coming in for a landing right here. Acts chapter 6. So they're generous givers. We see what's going on in the church right here. We see what happens when you're not, amen, struck down by God right there. Acts chapter 6, and right here in verse 1, it says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, so the church was growing, disciples were being made. The Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So the church grows. And now when the church grows, there's some shenanigans that pop up. And so there's these shenanigans and it's taking away the apostles time to focus on that instead of prayer and ministry of the word. And they say, hey, this is not right. We need to delegate and raise up leaders. And it's awesome, all the leaders we have here in the South region. So they delegate. This pleases everybody. And what happens as a, as a result, verse seven, so the word of God spread. The numbers of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So now the church is not just growing, but it's growing rapidly. There's rapid baptisms, there's rapid advancement, there's rapid growth because of the delegating and the focus on prayer and ministry of the word. Well, one of the guys, Stephen, he, he eventually gets persecuted and he actually gets martyred. He actually gets killed. And we're going to jump over to chapter eight right now in chapter eight, verse one, and see what happens because Stephen got killed. It says, and Saul approved of their killing him, talking about Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. 
So there's persecution. Imagine the church here in the South that literally only me and Karen are left and all of everybody else goes all around LA. That's what happened. Jerusalem, the apostles are there. And then all the disciples get scattered to the surrounding, area, the surrounding areas. And yet it says that they preach wherever they go. And so what had happened is that now all these churches were popping up all over the place. Disciples were getting baptized all over the place. And instead of just a church in Jerusalem, the church started to grow and to spread geographically as well. It's pretty incredible, right? But I'm sure this could have been a, a very discouraging situation. One of your brothers just died, got martyred, and yet they didn't give in to discouragement. They preached wherever they went. You know, our third and final point is simply everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. We've got to preach the word. We've got to share faith everywhere we go. And when I think about this, I'm just reminded of the 42 faithful missionaries coming down to L.A. from Portland years ago. And from 42, sold out disciples, preaching the word everywhere they went. We now have a church that's over 8,000 disciples in over 110 churches on every populated continent of the world. Woo! From Come on. 42 disciples sharing everywhere they went. Amen. It's incredible. And yet, guys, the job is not done. We have 14 churches we're planning this, this next year. We have countries and nations we need to get to. We have a world that we need to win for Christ. And how is this going to happen? By us preaching everywhere we go and sharing everywhere we go. You know, this just reminds me of the song, Can't Keep It to Myself. Can't keep it to myself. No, I can't keep it to myself. I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I can't keep it to myself. Just faith right there, man. But we, we, this is who we are. We can't keep it to ourselves. What God has done for us, how he saved us, what we have in the kingdom, the grace that we have, we cannot keep it to ourselves. We've got to share it. And it reminds me of the scripture in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 8 and 9. It says, whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. I'm getting persecuted. This is tough to preach the word. Verse nine. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. And in the same way of Jeremiah right here, it was the same in the first century church. It's the same with us. The word of God is a fire in our bones. We cannot hold it in. We just cannot do it. We've got to share it everywhere that we go. Come we on. cannot yeah. keep it to ourselves. And that's the charge. That's the final challenge is to share everywhere you go. This week, as we go out to stores, as we go out to parks, as we go out wherever we may go to our works, I want to challenge all of us. Share your faith everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, a gas station, a grocery store, wherever it may be, share everywhere you go. You know, in closing, guys, we're going to build a great church in the South. We already have a great church in the South, but we want to imitate everything the first century church did. What is it going to take? Perseverance and prayer. We've got to rely on God and persevere through our hardships so that we can grow into who he wants us to be. We've got to be generous givers. Guys, we cannot worship money. We cannot worship success. We need to worship God and give him all that we have. And we need to share everywhere we go. And then by doing this, we will have a great church. I love you guys. And to God be all the glory. Come on, Come on Joey. Come on, Joey. Come on bro. Come on, bro.